I'm glad to be here. It's uh, the first time I'm in this part of the world. Uh, so I'll, I'll say a few words first about me. Um, I'm a software engineer working for a Swedish company called Pharma. Um, in the past, uh, I've been uh, a job leader for uh, Java Azure in Macedonia. It's where I originally come from. Um, and I've been involved in various open source projects, uh, one of which is uh, the GSR 374, the JSON processing API for the Java EE platform. I'm part of uh, one of the ex expert group there, as well as uh, some other projects and communities um, throughout my career. Okay, so um, I'm going to guess uh, Klarna is quite unknown in this part of the world, most likely because we are actually not uh, operating in this part of the world. Um, so, uh, what is actually Klarna? Try to play a short video. I hope this works. Uh, it will be clear after. Uh, you have no consumers. 
Uh, that, that's kind of one part of the story. Uh, but since we are, for example, used in various of, uh, transportation services, you might be actually blocking someone's route going home. Um, if someone actually is preparing a party on a Friday evening, you might actually be blocking his purchase for that particular party in that specialty shop that uh, he wants to use. Uh, so you're kind of ruining your brand, but also ruining the, the merchant's brand. So which is kind of also very, very bad, uh, because the merchant uh, impact of, of outage is it's quite huge. Uh, some merchants actually um, rely on their entire business of their site working for particular days of the year. Uh, imagine being out on a Black Friday or Cyber Monday in the, in the US, or you're a Halloween uh, merchant, Halloween shop merchant, and you're out the day before Halloween. That's not something, that's not the situation you want to be in. Um, but of course, there is also an internal impact of, of outage. Uh, and that's definitely like the, the loss of money that you can have. Uh, it can happen in various different cases. So for ourselves, we run uh, microservices. So we can we can be quite a lot full total in having like uh, many services being done and we still uh, operate to a certain degree. But uh, having a service degradation can cause, uh, for example, errand costs on the customer support side, so you would get various different uh, customer support calls, and all of these cost money for you. At the same time, you're, you're, losing, uh, you're losing part of the business in maybe a critical time period. Okay, so that was a bit of a context. How do we actually get there? There are actually three things, and these three things only. One is like elimination of single points of failure, having a reliable crossover, and then being able to detect the failures as they occur. You don't even need to be able to detect if, if number one and number two actually work. But unfortunately, we are humans, we make mistakes, we need detection. First and most basic thing is automate all things. No humans in the picture, no chance for error. Uh, we are heavy on automation, and uh, we spend uh, quite a lot of time uh, uh, removing uh, repetitive tasks. Uh, we depend on various, uh, various open source uh, tools, uh, such as uh, I don't know, Helm, Kubernetes, Docker, and so on. This is actually our engineering support uh, team, rest as uh, Jenkins there. I know the local costume party that we have. Uh, my point is here that uh, it's, it's not so much about the engineering support and, and their lovely Jenkins uh, costumes. Uh, it's that we actually need to remove the repetitive task. Less interaction, less chance of error. It's really, really basic, but it's uh, many times overridden because uh, uh, some part of the organization usually thinks that uh, the automation is not worthwhile, it's uh, not going to save us money in the long run, uh, which is definitely not true because it, it, it uh, prevents us from creating errors. And not having errors is enough of a reason to, to invest in the automation. One big, uh, uh, big thing to mention is that uh, uh, service ownership is key for us. So, we are about, I don't know, 80 teams, approximately, um, running uh, several hundred services. Uh, so each of the teams are quite decentralized and, and uh, are really specialized into the domain. Uh, they, one, one good outcome of that is that people have narrow focus. If you have a buy button expert, he is a, that team is, knows every possible detail of the buy button they know what color is the best color for the buy button, they know what leads to the best buy button experience and so on. Uh, but that, uh, one thing I really actually think is the, the big game changer of giving uh, complete ownership and not having uh, dedicated ops teams is to have uh, to remove this culture of carrying a quick bad job. Uh, you could say that we are all responsible and we try to not do this and obviously people don't want to be uh, we're doing a quick workaround uh, and, and doing uh, quick patches, uh, but uh, 
if you are not fully responsible end to end for the service, you're going to end up doing this, even if it's a subconscious thing. Uh, so having a complete service ownership from each of the teams is uh, it's a key to having, uh, having certain stability. Uh, one thing also to think about is uh, how to actually do the rollouts. Um, we run most of the things in AWS, and the examples I will give are a little bit AWS specific, but they can be applied to any cloud uh, out there. It's not uh, uh, actually even in, in uh, bare bone uh, setups as well. So this is like a, a sample setup that we have that has a reliable crosser. So we have, first we have like the internet uh, gateway, internet facing gateway out there. After that, uh, we have DNS. The DNS is pointing to Elastic Loop Balancer, which has its own auto scaling group. Auto -scaling group. It's a classic uh, AWS setup. Uh, we generally, I, I know this is kind of a cliche term uh, by now, but uh, we, we tend to uh, treat our servers as cattle instead of pets, which means that we, uh, we are very lenient in, in killing and reinitializing re, uh, re the services uh, instead of having a, a kind of a snowflake uh, servers that uh, endlessly run. Um, so we are very much keen on having a immutable infrastructure and that has proven to be very successful. So um, I will start with which approach we used to, uh, quite a lot and most of the teams actually uh, were using for a long time. They, uh, of having a release. So um, it's the standard like rolling release approach that AWS suggests. So let's say you're running uh, version one and you have uh, three nodes uh, running version one. You add in the auto scaling group another service with version two. When that service becomes healthy, becomes operational, the will start sending traffic to that service. Uh, and then you add another service, you remove uh, uh, another one from V1, you add another V2, and so on. Then after a while, you end up with all services running V2. Uh, this is the standard sort of rolling release upgrade. There are different options you can do, uh, going like two services at, at, at a time, all services at a time. Uh, depends on, on uh, what uh, is the most convenient, depending on the use case. Uh, this this setup is, is quite quite good uh, for for doing uh, stable rollout um, because the servers only becomes active after uh, it initially says okay I'm healthy now you can you can start using me. Uh, and uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, we usually have at least three or four uh, servers uh, uh, at minimum uh, mostly because. AWS regions have uh, at least three or four uh, availability zones, which means different data centers. So you have to minimize the risk of having an outage in, in that those availability uh, zones. So this approach looks real well uh, for, for certain services, and most of the services are actually using this. But the ones that need to be highly available, we found out that uh, there is a problem with this approach. And that is if you have a policy in the, in the health check itself. Or midway through you notice an error that has occurred. So if let's say you're in this situation now where you have two, two instances running V2 and two instances running V1. Doing a rollback, it's a slow process. Um, it, it takes at least a couple of minutes. So those couple of minutes you're, you're running in a degraded mode because the V2 traffic is misbehaving or percentage of the big traffic is, uh, is not working out. So after uh, running for a while like this, we, not, we, we came up with a better approach uh, and that is use uh, Canary release. Um, so the idea of Canary goes back to uh, the, the mines uh, back in the day where people would, uh, uh, like miners would bring the Canary with them if the Canary died, they would know there is a poisonous gas and they need to live out because the canary would die out a lot faster than the humans would. If we apply the same concept here, we run, we run a small percentage of the, of the traffic to a new instance, 
and that percentage of traffic we see, okay, this is behaving well or not, and then we decide if we want to proceed. For AWS, uh, if we go back to like the original setup, uh, we, we were running uh, the DNS, an ELB, and an alt scaler. We decided using this kind of active, passive, uh, alt scaler approach. It's the simplest possible approach you can, you can pick. Uh, and that's the main reason why we picked it. So essentially you create another auto scaling group, a passive auto scaling group or the canary auto scaling group. Uh, that one is uh, empty for the most of the time of the running of the server. Uh, but the moment you want to add a new version to, to the production, you add an instance there. In the passive auto scaling, and you run that for a period of time. That's something that you could not do with the rolling list approach. You cannot leave it running for a longer period of time. So now, because the ELB, for example, is configured to use a rolling approach, 25% of the traffic will go to this, because it's for servers, 25% of the traffic goes to V2. Which is actually the only downside with this approach is that you have no complete granular uh, control of saying, okay, I want only 1% of the traffic to go here. You could do this with uh, DNS, you could do this uh, uh, with having a more, uh, more uh, a smart load balancer in front of this, but um, it, we try to keep ourselves to very basic, uh, uh, basic forms of, of components that we can use. So we try to keep as low as possible, so using the, the bare bone AWS components, and this way, has provided that it works for us. Usually, uh, when we roll out a new version, it's not like that the version does not version two does not completely work. It's like it's a particular edge case that was not caught by any of the automated tests. It was not caught in the other integration tests in the other environments. It's something that's very particular for the production environment, uh, and only there it happens. So. Uh, 25% for us is kind of a good approach to, to detect this type of edge cases. And we usually run for uh, I don't know, half an hour approximately uh, after, uh, after in, in the scan of the modes before actually saying, okay, it's all good. After we know everything is good, we still go over to like the rolling release approach and we do a rolling release in the active auto scaling group. And then we do is running in the auto, active auto scaling group. Another way to sort of achieve the same thing is to use feature toggles. You can have various different feature toggles and you can just throw slower a lot on the feature toggles. So you're kind of removing the infrastructure out of the setup. Everything is in the application. We do this for certain features, but we don't do that for like uh, rollout reasons. We only do that for uh, activation reasons. What do I mean by that? We found out that, that there is a really big problem with feature toggles in general, and that is testing. If you have one feature toggle, when you're testing your system, you need to test when the feature toggle is on and when the feature toggle is off. If you have 10 of these, you need to combine all the, all the, all the different combinations of having on and off of all of these. And if you're not really testing all the combinations, you're not testing the entire system that could be run in production. Even though at the given point of time, it is not run uh, like that in production. So like I three feature toggles are on, another three are off. You still need to test all the different combinations. There is also another problem with feature toggles is that some of these tended up to be long-lived ones. So one is enabled for production always, but it's not enabled for the playground environment at a given point in time. And this creates first confusion, but also creates various problems that are uh, that you're not, you're, all your apartments do not look the same. So if, if they do not look the same, that, then you're not really testing the production instance, or production-like instances. Uh, one other topic that kind of leads to this, uh, having a highly available system is uh, having API simplification. Uh, so API simplification would lead to like uh, less friction for, for uh, uh, for having uh, integration with the other components. And it, they lead to more uh, simple and more maintainable system. And 
one one thing to think about this, it's it's coupling. Um, most of the projects nowadays, or at least majority of them, are uh, either running uh, some form of microservice architecture or they are striving to write, write uh, uh, microservice architecture or they are in a more uh, traditional approaches, but uh, they have still several applications that are integrated with. One thing that we don't want to end up with is having a huge distributed monolith that's tightly coupled in various different ways. One thing that's often um, often not, uh, not thought of is uh, URI coupling, and that is having uh, URI dependencies between the different systems. Uh, let's uh, <coughs> look at uh, like a, a link uh, uh, service approach. So let's say we are, have a client here. It's doing some request to of, uh, the first server, <coughs> and after a while it needs to do some set of requests to the second server only after it called the first server. So if the client knows the location of the first server and knows the location of the second server, um, it keeps two different sort of URIs. But if we sort of think about it more, it, it doesn't really need to have the, the URI of the second because we know that we are always going to call the first one. So the first one could be the one that actually knows about the second one. This way, the existence of the second one or the location of the second one does not need to be known to the client. So in a more practical example, so let's say we have a, a customer with the name Alice. Instead of uh, knowing the location of the customer, we can instead have a hyperlink inside pointing to the location. This way, we don't actually have to know about the server, the server's location. There is actually something uh, called the uh, Richardson maturity model. Uh, it's based on uh, Leonard Richardson's um, um, text that uh, uh, breaks down the different ways to create REST services. Uh, and sort of the, the highest level is having a full hypermedia as the engine of uh, application state or a uh, hate OS uh, sort of no. Like very basically, everyone usually starts with a uh, uh, a super simple servers which doesn't really have like resources. Then they sort of move into the resources and having certain verbs on those resources, but at the highest level is having this uh, links between the actual resources. And the links benefit is this, is the coupling of the, of the location of where the, uh, where the uh, resources are placed or, or processed. Another way to achieve this, and it's a uh, quite popular nowadays is to have a service registry. It was actually mentioned in the keynote. Um, basically, if you need a, I don't know, user service, service let's say, um, the user service location, you don't need to know where it is. You have a service registry where you ask, okay, where is the user service? There is a really big problem with this approach, and that is you're making an assumption that the registry is running, and it will always be running. So if you have many different services that are registered in this registry, you're assuming that the registry is highly available and uh, will always run, which is not always true. Um, that's why usually these registries are either picked to be super simple uh, so that they can be easily distributed and made highly available. So that's the case, for example, of Apache Zookeeper or Netflix Eureka and, uh, I don't know, distributed uh, hash maps that, uh, that uh, contain the location of this. So that way, uh, we have a super sort of dumb service that contains the location of all the linked services. Another form that uh, it's often not uh, thought of, another form of coupling that is often not thought of is uh, the, te the temporal coupling. What do I mean by temporal coupling? Uh, I mean the time processing uh, for different services. And basically it goes, goes to this. If you're, if you're using a synchronous approach, you're expecting that there is a response in time x. If you're using a synchronous approach, you do not expect a response in time x for the most part. You can have a call to the server, 
and then you get a reply without actually waiting for their actual reply. The same thing could be said for having a pooling approach versus a callback approach. Instead of constantly asking the server, are you, are you done, are you done, are you done, you got a callback saying, okay, I'm done now. Um, one way to have a, a, a safeguard for having uh, spikes in, in, in the request load time, if we have a fast producing server, so like uh, a fast producing orange server here, uh, and a client is calling this fast producing server, so uh, fast producing in the sense that it makes a lot of calls to other internal services. One easy way to avoid overload is to have a queue in, in between. You put a queue and then the request processor is reading from the queue on, at its own pace. So if the request processor is slow, it does this at its own pace. For example, system like this is a classic example is a mail server. A mail server is, is like this, right? Uh, we try to send mails, but you cannot really send like thousands of mails at, at a time. You send by batches of 100 or by batches of 50, and they are all in certain mail queue. The queue can be anything. It can be, I don't know, uh, Kafka, AWS, uh, SNS, or uh, pretty much anything. Another form that uh, is also often uh, forgotten is uh, the coupling of the data structures that we pick. Like a classic example is date time. Date time is very much misunderstood. Uh, let's say you're using Ruby for programming and then you're using, I don't know, uh, JavaScript and one is using a library that represents the time in milliseconds, the other one is using it in nanoseconds. It's very easy to make this, this mis distinction. And if you add like time zones into the mix, uh, things get severely more complicated. Uh, that's why it's good to have certain level of standards in your internal systems uh, for, for these sort of basic things. Um, any standard actually like ISO uh, anything, uh, like currency or whatever, it's, it can lead to uh, confusion if it's not aligned across the different projects. And if you leave the defaults from the languages that people use, uh, it, it leads to a huge confusion. We, for example, have servers that are running in Java, Ruby, Clojure. We have quite a lot that, that are running in Erlang as well. So it's very key to, to have a, a strict def definition of, of the most basic data, data formats that you're gonna use. Like, it, it's very simple to make a mistake in phone numbers, for example. Uh, let's say you want to represent phone numbers. How would you do that? use an international format. If you use the local format, then the local format is tied to a country code. Which country code? It gets severely more complicated. You cannot really just deduct on that. Uh, it's just by picking the right format might make, the, make a huge difference. All of these uh, service patterns that I mentioned are uh, in a lovely book called uh, Service Design Patterns. It's a .NET book, but it's still a good book. Um, they, it goes into a lot more details about uh, having uh, uh, functional temporal coupling and how, how to look into the different data structure coupling. Uh, another thing uh, that we uh, generally want to consider is uh, uh, having different uh, stability patterns. And that's uh, something I want to talk about in the following period. It also leads to having a highly available system. Um, there is a, another great book that I want to recommend. It's called Release It. It has nothing to do uh, with releasing. Um, it's one of the most uh, badly named books, but it's a, it's a great book about running your systems in production. Uh, it's the cornerstone of the most of the things that we are seeing today and most of the topics that we will be hearing today for uh, all of the stabilities, uh, chaos engineering, uh, cloud native Java, and so on. Um, so I'll mention several of the patterns that we use and, and like some of the errors that we run into by not having these. And first one, it's super basic one, and majority of uh, applications out there do not have this in place. It's a basic timeout. 
So if you look at Apache HTTP client, for example, um, there are several timeouts that you need to have configured. The idea is that if we don't have a timeout, you're endlessly keeping the connection, and with that, you're endlessly either tripping a, uh, tipping, uh, keeping a thread active and you, or some other resource on your machine. So you, you're going to run out of that particular resource if, you, if you're endlessly keeping it. So having a timeout sort of stops you from doing that. Uh, for Apache HTTP client, uh, there is connection timeout, there is a connection establishment timeout, there is SSL resolution timeout. We actually had a case where uh, there was a bug in the Apache HTTP client where uh, the SSL resolution didn't work for a particular al algorithm and uh, the timeout was not applied in that case. Uh, so we slowly noticed that the number of threads is growing over time. It was a particular callback to a merchant and the merchant was using a particular SSL scheme and in that case, uh, that ca in that case the, the timeout was not applied. Uh, and it's, it's very, a very simple mistake to make. Uh, and, and it's super basic and super easy to, to, to add timeouts. So please do add timeouts like today. <laughs> Another thing uh, that's uh, conceptual is having circuit breakers in place. Uh, so if we look at the physical concept of having circuit breakers, you have a uh, circuit breaker uh, in your house. If there is a uh, overload on the network, the circuit fuse goes off. So the, the next time you, you, you figure out what's actually causing the overload, you're removing that out of the picture, then you bring back the, the circuit breaker on. So in a more real example, if uh, we have a client with a circuit breaker, it's calling some bad behaving service. Instead of dragging down the entire system because of this bad behaving service, uh, after n retries or after a certain level of threshold, we go back to a fallback mode. Uh, either we are calling a fallback server or we are calling a fallback uh, um, instance or we are kind of removing the functionality altogether. And we do use this quite often. That allows us to run the server in a more uh, degraded mode. Uh, we're not having all the functionalities, but the users can still buy without a problem. Um, for example, ne uh, Netflix Hitrix is one of these uh, tools that uh, has this uh, figured out in a more granular approach. Uh, we use this for some of the services, but not, not for all. Um, another really simple thing to do is uh, having handshaking. So if your client uh, constantly asks okay, can, can the server process a bit more uh, resources? The server says, okay, I can have another 10%. And in each, in each request, if the server responds with, okay, I can have X amount of, uh, X amount of calls made more, uh, we are kind of not overloading the, the, the server. This is always not applicable to, to all architectures, but in many cases, it can be easily added. So basically, a, a fast system should never overwrite a slow one. Uh, it goes back again to this uh, mail server example that we discussed a little bit earlier. Um, so there are various tools nowadays for this. Actually, uh, most of the reactive streams, uh, reactive streams um, API that uh, that was uh, defined for Java uh, had these uh, concepts in, in place, and uh, uh, tools like Akka do this as well. Uh, so actually, there is a, a talk later today about chaos engineering that, that has this uh, top topic, uh, hopefully, in a lot more details. Um, another sort of stability pattern is uh, having uh, bulkheads, and unfortunately, the internet is still loading this. Um, okay, so bulkheads are, are um, coming, again, from a physical concept. Uh, if you look at uh, ships or submarines are usually uh, a good example. Uh, they have different compartments. So if one compartment gets flooded, the ship still operates. Um, it increases like the structural integrity of the vessel or the system as a whole. Uh, 
more compartments reduce the risk of, uh, of leaking the water across, uh, across your ship. In a more real world example is having a really simple, like very basic example is having connection poles. Uh, this is also something that uh, most of the time developers get it wrong and I mean we got it wrong initially as well. It's having a shared connection pool for all services or for set of services. If you are sharing the same connection pool and you have a misbehaving like failing servers, that failing server is going to eat up the connections for the other server that's totally fine at the moment. So instead of having a degradation in just one functionality that's handled by this failing server, you're actually failing the whole system or failing the functionalities from both of these servers. A simple approach is to have just separate connection pools for separate services. Okay, so that were kind of more of the stability, uh, the stability patterns I wanted to mention. So, as I said, we are we are humans. We make errors. Um, if everything of this was already gotten right, we don't need to have monitoring. In reality, on the other hand, we need monitoring very much, uh, and it's one of the hot topics of the coming years, I would say. So we want to detect failures, failures as they occur or as soon as possible. Uh, one simple thing that we use is uh, having traceability or having uh, correlation IDs um, uh, or tracking IDs. So if you have uh, different servers, like, I don't know, you have a Node.js application, there is a Spring application, there is a Clojure application, and tons of other servers uh, down the stream. The entry point application creates a correlation ID. That correlation ID or tracking ID is propagated down to the other servers. This way, whenever they log the request that got triggered from the original node application, they can log the ID. This way you can track how that request uh, affected the whole system. And this has proven quite beneficial for us. Uh, we use a tool called Splunk. I mean, it's a commercial tool. I don't want to kind of promote the commercial site. I kind of promote it AWS to some extent, but uh, uh, the same concept is applicable in other places as well. You can use uh, Kibana, for example. You, you can use, uh, there are tons of lo uh, Lodash and so on. Um, uh, oh, sorry, Logstash. Um, so in Splunk, basically, we have this correlation ID. It's for us, it's usually created on the Nginx nodes and then that gets propagated to all the other servers. So each request, we can see how it affected across different systems. So this correlation ID, we can see it, uh, just by searching the correlation ID, I can see everything that happened in all the systems. It's a very neat way to de detect the failures. If we take this to the next level, uh, and we are actually ha build, we are building, or actually using our own internal tool that's uh, very similar to this, this is uh, a Twitter tool called Zipkin. It's based on a Google, a Google Draper paper um, that kind of defines uh, traceability in distributed systems. Um, so the idea is very simple, that uh, you apply this correlation ID to track down processing time across different systems. So if the original request took, uh, I don't know, one second, you can see how much of that time was spent across the different uh, across the different individual systems. Uh, it's a really neat way to, to track things. We are building our own for uh, slightly different reasons, but uh, it's very simple to do this. So you, you don't really have to use Zipkin, but it's a really nice approach to, to track down uh, performance issues uh, as well as other type of uh, bugs. Another thing uh, in this area of detecting failures as they occur is to have a time series uh, time series uh, data uh, uh, base. Ah, sorry. Uh, one, one other thing is to have this uh, um, sort of uh, health checks. Uh, so the health checks are also like a key component in the AWS setup. You need to have a health check in order to register the servers in the availability zone and so on. But there are other type of health checks that kind of say that the system is working in aggregated mode and so on. Uh, we have a tool that we plan to open source that's called Monks. Uh, it's essentially a wrapper of uh, CloudFormation. It 
just reads from AWS, okay, give me all the services that are tagged with this uh, uh, particular tag, uh, and get, uh, get all the health checks that are tied to this. So the health checks are all defined in the server themselves, so this, uh, this, that's why I call them internal health checks. So for example, um, we have uh, here a set of, uh, set of health checks. Uh, this can be, uh, I don't know, number of uh, orders per second uh, is going down, or uh, there is, we, are, we are running, we are close to running out of memory, or we are doing too many uh, GC pauses, or pretty much anything that's relevant to your system. We also add health checks uh, for the dependent services. So uh, let's say uh, you have a hard dependency on another uh, system for uh, majority of your, your processing. Even though your system is behaving fine, the, the, uh, you have a significant degradation. So we add a health checks for that, and we call them, um, uh, we call them um, uh, non-actionable by teams. So that way, uh, when, uh, when an alert happens or there is a pager to the call, someone gets the call from uh, the responsible team and not from the team that first detected that sort of. These are all great, but they are not really, really uh, telling the full story. They are not showing the reality. You must have external checks. So if you have an internet-facing service, you must be checking in all the areas you, you're actually operating in. Um, we have set up all, uh, checks constantly that uh, uh, do uh, the basic operations for uh, our system from different locations where we operate. So from, I don't know, uh, US, uh, various areas of Europe, across the different devices, they constantly try to create requests and see what happens there. Uh, sometimes the requests fail because of internet issues between the different areas. So they need to be made in, some, uh, in a sense that uh, uh, you don't get constantly bugs for inter-Atlantic uh, uh, connection drops or, uh, or so on. Uh, we use a tool called Apica, but there are plenty of other tools out there. And this is how we actually measure the uptime at the end. It's only the external uptime that really matters. If you're using the internal checks uh, for, for measuring uptime, you're not really measuring, uh, you're not measuring the real uptime. There are tons of other tools, like uh, there is a tool actually called Uptime Pink Dome, and I don't know, Uptime Robot, Vachette, and, and so on. And it's really easy to roll out your own, uh, you roll out your own tool. Um, okay, so next sort of topic I want to talk keep uh, is about having a constant stream of, of time, uh, time series. Um, like majority of our teams use this setup, and the teams that I've been involved uh, are either usually uh, running a, a Java service, either it's a Drop Wizard or it's a Spring Boot uh, server. And then um, most of the aggregation of the metrics, so like all of these metrics, uh, number of requests per second or number of completed orders per second. The aggregation happens on the server itself. But uh, there are certain events that we don't have the aggregation on the server because they are by nature not uh, uh, server oriented. So like, I don't know, client side events, uh, browser events. Uh, we have different aggregation tools like uh, Riman or Spark that, uh, that run and uh, try to pull out the actual metric. Once this metric is aggregated, we uh, use uh, Graphite as a time series database. So um, how many of you have uh, uh, used uh, graphite. Uh, anyone? Yes? Okay. So they, uh, the idea of graphite is that it uh, stores uh, time series metrics in, and you can set up to, to be in a sort of uh, compact way uh, so that, uh, the, for example, the last two weeks you have a full detailed uh, uh, data and as time goes by you have less, less gradual data. So that's where you don't, you're not spending a lot of money on storing the, da the actual data but uh, the most recent data is really accurate. Um, so then we use Grafana to, to visualize uh, these metrics. This sort of looks more uh, reasonable if, if you see it like this. Uh, so this is, uh, for example, uh, the previous day versus the current day in number of orders, or 
uh, what's the free disk pace at a given point of time, is it uh, constantly growing and so on. It's, it's really good to have this because you can notice trends. So the, the bug that I mentioned for Apache HTTP client with the SSL resolution, we noticed it in this way. Uh, we were monitoring the thread utilization and it was linearly growing. Uh, and that didn't seem right. The number of orders was not growing, the number of requests was not growing, but the number of threads was growing. So it was very easy to notice it with the time series uh, uh, event monitoring. If we didn't have that, we would not have found the actual issue and it would have failed in production uh, instead, of, instead of being located before. Unfortunately, time series event monitoring is also quite hard and I'll explain a few problems that uh, are, are quite common. One of these is having uh, seasonal changes. Uh, so for example, that during the day for us in our business, uh, majority of buys happens around five to seven o'clock after work or it's happening a lot around the lunch break or early in the morning. Or um, let's say uh, Black Friday is coming up, all of a sudden the number of orders becomes a lot bigger. So what is the actual threshold you wanna pick? If you look at the internal health checks, uh, like how many orders is it normal to have? It's very hard to, to say. Uh, it's very hard to, to have a clear definition of that. You cannot even also have like a percentage-based metric. You cannot say uh, there shouldn't be a drop of 40% because it could be that 40% drop is something that's quite normal. Um, so seasonal changes are really uh, uh, quite painful to, uh, for this approach, for, at least for the business-related metrics. Uh, for certain metrics like, I don't know, hard disk space, it's quite easy to actually determine uh, what, what's normal. Another problem is uh, uh, that's very easy mistake to do is just by looking at average. So let's say we have a service that uh, takes from zero to 100 seconds. Uh, like we, we had various different calls and some of them take, I don't know, 45 seconds. Majority of them are in the 70 range. So they kind of follow a normal distribution. So if we look at the average of uh, average time, uh, average processing time, it will be 58-ish uh, for this distribution, which kind of fits the 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 real the reality. If it's 58 for m majority of users, it's kind of 58. If if we look at uh, if we look at for example the median value, it's around 50, uh, okay, 60, which is also kind of closer to what is the reality. So for normal distribution, this works nicely. And maybe things are following the normal distribution in, uh, in nature, but in computer systems, things do not necessarily follow the normal distribution. And here is an example. Let's say we have this distribution where like a half, almost half of the users are between uh, zero and, and 25 seconds, and then another half is in between 19 and 100 seconds. So if you just look at the averages, you're saying you're, you're, you're taking on average uh, 50 seconds, which is true, but for half of your users, you're being horrible. Uh, and same at looking at, uh, at uh, uh, the median value, you will see that uh, it's, it's uh, around 60, but that again is not representative. So what's the actual fix for this is having percentiles having, for example, what's the, what's the average time, not, what's the time that it takes for the 20% of the users, what's the time that it takes for 50% of the users, what's the time that it takes for 90 and for 99. Then you have a more uh, wide picture of what actually is happening within your system. Uh, and actually this is a picture from a real application that uh, uh, we had. Uh, and for a long time we were monitoring the, the, the mean value which was 4.3 seconds, which was very acceptable. We were planning things to run under five seconds and it meant this is great. In reality though, things were not so great. Uh, almost like 10% of, even more than 10% realistically, were a lot slower than five, five seconds. Actually close to 10% were running over 10 seconds. Uh, so having percentiles gives you a slightly better picture of the distribution as a whole. 
if we take this uh, to, to the next level, um, there is a, a, a sort of the future of this time series monitoring. There is a great book called Anomaly Detecting for Monitoring. Uh, and it's using uh, machine learning and uh, using statistical models to detect different anomalies. Uh, so the idea is that you have tons of different metrics and you're able to use these principles to get detection of uh, sudden shifts. So those still need to be looked out by, by a real person. So someone needs to still check, okay, why did we have a drop? Maybe it's because it was Black Friday yesterday and now today we have less orders. But maybe it was a real issue. So if you, if you, if you put this in place, uh, you will try to get these results. And we are, it's something that we are currently experimenting with uh, because there are so many different metrics we will like to keep track of. Uh, this will allow us in a more easy way to, to detect uh, changes as early as possible. So to sum up, it's three things. It, and it, it's the original three things that I mentioned at the beginning. We eliminate the single point of failure, we have a reliable crossover, and we monitor things. That's all it takes to have all the nines you ever wanted. Thank you for your time, and I'm not sure we have time for questions. We have time for questions. Great. Yes? So, as a question, we're showing us how to do the reverse transgression using Python web canary release. Yes? How do you do for databases? Yes, for database, um, we, we have uh, um, sort of like a, a sticky ID on the session. So, the, uh, so mo most of the sessions are really, uh, we, we run with several databases at a given point of time. Uh, for a longer period of time until all the sessions migrated because we have short-lived uh, data. Uh, like the, the most of the systems that I've been involved, it's usually the session is kept for a week at maximum. So then after a week, the old database sort of is useless and you kill the old database. I mean, the database is still RDS. It's highly, uh, highly available and, and replicated and so on. Uh, but we use that approach for, for those. And, and technically, you can uh, implement the same approach even for long-lived data with the other twist that in, for long-lived data, you uh, need to have, at some point, a shift of the data. Like, you need to start the, uh, you need to do the replication. But for our use case, because we have short-lived sessions, um, we don't uh, really have to have the, the migration in place. But there, there are tons of tools uh, for AWS and for most of the database, actually, that, that solve this. It's actually usually the commercial tool of the database, but uh, it cost, it's, it's an easy thing to get uh, wrong, uh, the replication. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's the general approach. Yes, yes. So generally, the, uh, I mean, if you think about for, you know, for the regular rolling release approach, uh, the database needs to be forward uh, compatible and backward compatible at all times. So let's say you're getting a request for version two uh, of the application. The version two database schema needs to be compatible with version one. In what sense? Uh, it can be additions to fields but it cannot be removing of fields. You cannot be like running, okay, migrate the database. You need to model the data in such a way uh, that, uh, that it al allows this. F for our case, for example, even though we use relational database, uh, we use um, uh, Postgre RDS, uh, we model the data in a quite unstructured way. We usually have like, uh, I don't know, order ID as key, uh, but uh, most of the data is either kept as a JSON blob internally in the database. So that allows this to be super easy. But you can achieve the same thing uh, with more, uh, with better modeling of the data. We just didn't want to get into the problem of, uh, of the exact thing you mentioned, that you're running version two, which is incompatible with version one, which is actually sometimes easy thing to do. 
We actually run for some of the servers uh, uh, like automated tests that check version one and version two if there is a issue with the schema. So you write an order with version two and you read it with version one or the other way around uh, so that we can, you can see that that actually works. Uh, so I mean, you don't need to have the auto scaling. You just need to have two instances of your your servers. Like, you need to run the old version. You need to run the new version and uh, write with, for example, the old one and read it with the new one and the other way around. So, if you do that and uh, you do that in the tests, then you're kind of covered the the case. And you have to do that not just for the canary. You need to do that for the rolling release as well. Uh, it's the kind of assumption uh, that you're making with uh, running the servers in this way. You need to look, look at all the percentiles, actually. <laughs> that, that's like, uh, I don't know, 20, 50, 90, 99, I would say it's kind of the, the base. Uh, uh, because uh, ju just by looking at the, uh, the average, you see like, for the, in this case, average is 4.3 seconds. And it's not really representative. If, if you look at it, it's, it's not really the reality. Sure, the average is 4.3, but it's not great. OK, I think we're running out of time. Uh, but feel free to catch me up later. It's, uh, it's totally fine. Thank you.